If you've been watching this channel, then you'll know that I've been on a project to review the seasons of the Revolutions podcast by Mike Duncan. I've been working my way through season by season and giving my thoughts as I go for whatever those thoughts may or may not be worth. Uh, and if you haven't been watching, I'll, I'll link to all my previous reviews in the description down below. But I am now up to season eight, just finished season eight, the Paris Commune uh, of Revolutions podcast. And I'm here to give my thoughts on it. Now, I'm going to do my usual thing where I ramble on and on in a somewhat disorganized way and just empty my head of all my thoughts. But uh, uh, I'll try and be succinct here at the beginning and, and give the short version. I thought this season was absolutely fascinating. Uh, it was uh, Mike, Mike Duncan did a great job of making this digestible, making it understandable, and making it interesting. Uh, and he's he's really come into his peak storytelling powers at, at about this time in his career. Uh, I mean, I think it, it gets even better when he gets into the Russian Revolution, but uh, th th this was great. I was absolutely captivated while I was listening to it. Of course, you've got to take my opinion with a grain of salt because Paris Commune is one of my uh, special historical interests. So, uh, you know, of course I'm going to be captivated by it. But I, I, th I thought this was just so well told, wasn't it? I, I was completely enthralled while I was listening to it, but... I do think that, I, I wonder if it should have been longer. I, I, I'm not sure, but my suspicions are it would have been even better uh, if it had been a few episodes longer and had maybe a few more details introduced in here. There, there's a few things he skipped over. Or I don't know, maybe it's perfect just like it is. Like I said, I'm, I'm a little bit on the fence about it. Okay, that that's my short version. Now I, I'm going to get into all my detailed thoughts on this. So I, as I mentioned briefly before, this Paris Commune is one of my special areas of historical interest. Uh, the first time I heard about it was when I was taking a college class on 19th century Europe, and uh, the professor very briefly mentioned it. A Paris Commune did not get its own lecture. She just tacked it on very briefly to uh, the revolutions of 1848. Uh, in which she was talking about the conflict between the socialist revolutions and the republican revolutions. And she just said something at the tail end like um, th this division would go on to become more exasperated in the Paris Commune, uh, which was a socialist revolutionary revolution, but uh, involving Karl Marx, she said. Uh, but it fell apart because the revolutionaries couldn't agree on what they wanted. I, I actually got the impression from her lecture that the Paris Commune was a mini episode within the 1848 revolution. Um, but that, that's, that's all I got from it. But it, it was enough to uh, pique my interest. Uh, so I went out and uh, read a few more books on the Paris Commune. I, I went through a couple different phases on this. One is when I was still in college. Uh, and, you know, 21, 22, 23, right, right after I just graduated, which I read a few books on the Paris Commune and uh, eventually did learn that the Paris Commune was not part of the 1848 revolutions. And in fact, it took place uh, a whole 20 some years later in 1871. Uh, and then I got back into it in my late 20s, in, in which I read several books. And by the late 20s, I had my blog up. So I was reviewing those books as I read them on my blog. Uh, I was fascinated by the Paris Commune for a few different reasons. Uh, one is, uh, I, when, when we think about socialist revolutions, I, I think we often think about the 20th century, right? Lenin and the Bolsheviks or uh, Castro in Cuba or Mao and the communists. Uh, and, and we think about all the, um, the, the, the brief period of ideali idealism followed by long periods of depressing bureaucracy that uh, so, uh, accompanies with the, the socialist revolutions or, you know, the guerrilla warfare 
which uh, accompanies the, the socialist revolutions in Cuba and China, etc. But, but the Paris Commune is a, a socialist revolution that, that's coming on the tail end of the cycles of 19th century revolutions. So it's got the barricades, it's got the red flags, uh, it's got the, the, the Paris street mobs. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of like the French Revolution, but with the, the socialist aspect added to it. So that, that little bridge be uh, coming as it does at the end of the cycle of French revolutions in the 19th century, and then connecting ahead to the socialist revolutions of the 20th century, that fascinated me. But what also fascinated me is the thing my professor mentioned briefly, uh, is that um, it's a classic example of leftist groups being more concerned with arguing with each other than they were with uh, actual victory. Uh, now, I, that, I, I know that's the least charitable lens through which to view the Paris Commune. But that, that is one possible framing of the story of the Paris Commune. Uh, and that has gone on to characterize leftist politics in so many different epochs of history uh, and, and uh, you know, ar arguably characterizes leftist politics right down to the present day. Um, but, but certainly when I was involved in um, more radical politics, that, that seemed to characterize everything that was wrong with it. Uh, so it was, it was a little morality tale of um, these leftists who were so concerned with their own little ideological vision of it that they just couldn't come together and got crushed, crushed by the Versailles government. Uh, now, as Mike Duncan says in his, um, uh, in, in his podcast, it's an open question whether or not they could have succeeded under any circumstances. Like, even if they had been unified, could they have withstood the Versailles uh, assault from Versailles, but they they certainly did not get their act together and did not become unified, and that did not help things at all. So so I found those two uh, elements of it very fascinating. So um, read read a number of books on the Paris Commune in my late twenties. I I don't know about ten books or something. That, that's, that's good for me. Uh, I, I tend to be a slow reader, only read a handful of books a year. Uh, so the Paris Commune became somewhat of my area of expertise that I had carved out for myself in, in history. Now, all that being said, having claimed a little bit of area of expertise on this, I'm going to back off on this slightly. One is uh, my late 20s were now... 15, almost 20 years ago now, as I've gotten older. So uh, all of those books that I read, uh, I'm relying on memories that are 15 years or more in the past. So it, it's all kind of half remembered. And then even at the time, it was all a little bit jumbled in my mind. So, so maybe some of you can identify with this if, if you've ever read a number of books on a certain subject. Uh, if, if you're not taking notes and if you're not doing a serious study of this, you read one book and it, it kind of gives you a, a certain picture of it. And it's, of course, you never remember everything you read perfectly. So it's all kind of half jumbled there. And then you read another book and it gives you a, a completely, a somewhat different picture. I was going to say completely, but let, let's go with somewhat. Somewhat different picture where you're, you're remembering stuff the, the, there, there are some things in the second book which were not in the first book, and there are some things in the first book which were not in the second book. So you're trying to fit those puzzle pieces together. And the, there, there are some things that are the same, but they've got a slightly different narrative. And then the third book gets over the top of that. And I think this is especially true with a subject like the Paris Commune which has so many things going on, on on it. I mean, all revolutions are confusing, but the Paris Commune can be especially confusing because we start off, I mean, and, 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 and imagine, imagine first getting into this, right? Me first getting into this in my 20s. I really don't have a solid grasp on 19th century French history yet. 
you're starting off with the Paris Commune and you've got the uh, all the different factions in French politics. The monarchists, the legitimist monar monarchists, the Orleonists. Then you have the Bonapart Bonapartists who are in power at the beginning of 1871, against which you have the Republican opposition, the liberal opposition, uh, and then you have the radical opposition. Uh, you know, I, I, I was confused when I was reading uh, one of the Marxist history of the Paris Commune, in which he's throwing around liberal like a dirty word. And I, I, I'm thinking, well, well I, aren't the liberals the good guys? I mean, don't, don't they free you from the Bonapartist empire? Uh, but, you know, the, 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 as in 1848, the liberals are going to come down and, and crush the, the radicals. Uh, there. So the, uh, if you read a Marxist history of the Paris Commune, the, the liberals are not the good guys. Uh, but then uh, within the radicals, you have so many divisions among them. As, uh, and, and now Mike Duncan makes as much sense about, about this as anybody. Uh, you've got the Blanquists, uh, the Neo-Jacobins, and the Anarchists. Now, I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later because I, I wonder if Mike Duncan almost makes a little bit too much sense out of that. Th th there's also the Marxist, maybe, but uh, Mike Duncan skips the Marxists because they were a very negligible force in the Paris Commune. Um, but, but this is as uh, Karl Marx's movement is beginning to come into its own. Uh, and then uh, the Paris yeah, then you've got the different revolutions. You've got the revolution that takes place in September, the Republican Revolution. Then you've got the Paris Commune Revolution, which takes place in March. But uh, as Mike Duncan uh, narrates, the, the Paris Commune had a lot of different people claiming authority. There were the mayors. There was the Central Committee of the National Guard. There was the uh, uh, elections itself, which constituted the Paris Commune. But then... Over those two months, the, the government the morphs into a few different uh, into a few different um, structures. Well, the Central Committee of the National Guard is still claiming authority, and it, it's all just a bit of a mess. I mean, a, a fascinating mess, but a bit of a mess. And uh, a lot of the popular histories of the Paris Commune that I read were popular histories. They they or, or they were not overly interested in a systematic analysis of these different governments that were going on. The, the best book I read in terms of like trying to trace everything and keep track of all the different people is, is a book that also pops up on Mike Duncan's bibliography. So if you go to Mike Duncan's website, he, he gives his bibliography. And that's The Fall of Paris by Alistair Horn. Um, and uh, that, that's one that's Mike, Mike Duncan is also listed on his bibliography. Um, another book that I've read on the Paris Commune, which is also Mike Duncan's bibliography, is uh, The History of the Paris Commune by, where is it? Uh, yeah, sorry by Prosper Oliver Lisagare, uh, who, uh, th this is the Marxist version of the um, Paris Commune. And Lisagare was a communard who survived and then went on to become part of Karl Marx's uh, inner circle. Um, and the other, looking at Michael Duncan's bibliography, the, the uh, other one that we overlap on is The Insurrectionist by Jules Valls. Uh, Valet, um, uh, sorry, I, might, I should have said this at the beginning of the review, but I, I never learned how to pronounce French names. And, and the, the, the problem with getting all your information from reading is that you don't, you don't hear them spoken. So you'll, you'll have to forgive me on that. I, anyways, uh, that, that's a bit of a difficult book to track down. Uh, because it was only, uh, as far as I can tell, only ever translated into English uh, during a brief period in 1971 when there was renewed interest in the Paris Commune. Renewed interest in the Paris Commune for a couple reasons in 1971. One, it was the 200th, sorry, 100th 
anniversary of the Paris Commune. Uh, and two, uh, because of the uh, student movements, both in the US and in France, uh, there was a renewed interest in the uh, anarchist element of the Paris Commune as anarchism was coming back into fashion in, in France uh, during the 1968 uprising. Um, but yeah, uh, the, you know, it's, it's been out of print in English since 1971. So I was able to track down a used copy through uh, Amazon because I was interested in reading it. Michael Duncan must have either used Amazon or his uh, library. Um, probably his library, huh? He talks a lot about how he uses the university library to get all these books. But I, I'm a bit surprised, actually, that Mike Duncan put it on his bibliography because he doesn't seem to have uh, referenced that book at all uh, or, or I, as far as I can tell, used any details from it um, in, his, in his podcast. But it, it is on his bibliography. The, the rest, uh, um, and then, this, of course, The Civil War in France by Karl Marx. Yep. Uh, and some of Karl Marx's political writings I've also read. Uh, the rest of the books on Michael Duncan's bibliography I haven't read. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and link to uh, my bibliography and Michael Duncan's bibliography uh, in the description down below. Okay, so sorry, I, I know I'm taking forever to get to the point as I usually do, but that's my background on this. So uh, in terms of Mike Duncan, uh, recounting of this, like I said, I found it absolutely fascinating, but um, I wonder if it was a little bit too short. And you, you know, you know, this this is my area of special interest, or at least it was at one time. So obviously, I'm going to be a little bit biased towards this. But when I first looked at this, uh, and I noticed that Mike Duncan only had eight episodes on this, I thought, oh, only eight episodes. Well, okay, okay, eight episodes is still something. But then I noticed that we spend four episodes before we even get to the commune. So we really only have four episodes of the commune, and of those, one is of the canons, so the start of the commune, and one is of Bloody Week, so the fall of the commune. So we really only have two episodes on the Paris Commune. Um, which, is that enough or should it be longer? Now, now l let me address the obvious thing, which is I've got no business complaining about this, right? Because um, who else is going to give eight episodes worth of content on the Paris Commune? Now, granted, four of those are leading up episodes, but... Um, Still, uh, e even if we just look at the two episodes focused on the Paris Commune, which is 8.6 and 8.7, that's still two 40-minute episodes on the Paris Commune. I mean, I mean, uh, good episodes. Where else are you going to find 40 minutes, uh, 80 minutes on, on the Paris Commune? I, I don't know. It's probably out there somewhere on YouTube or podcasts or something like that. But... Um, the, the, the last time I looked for it, and now granted the last time I looked for it was quite some years ago when I was into this stuff, but it, it was hard to find decent audio content on the Paris Commune. And, and here we've, we've got something that anywhere you cut it is, is a lot longer than what you might expect to find. Add to that, uh, I'm not paying Mike Duncan anything at all, so this, this is all free content I'm getting. So what right have I to complain? about it, right? Um, but uh, I, I view my function here as a reviewer. Uh, a, a reviewer's job is not to say, well, I shouldn't complain because it's all free, right? A, a, re a reviewer's job, uh, I think, is, is to compare the product to the idealized product that the reviewer can imagine might be created. And I'm, I'm borrowing this definition a little bit from Freddie DeBoer when he talks about the, the, the job of a reviewer. So uh, the reviewer's job is not to say, well, you know, okay, I can't complain because I'm getting this for free. And well, I understand it's a little bit short because he was getting ready to move to Paris, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The, the reviewer's job is to say, 
Could it have been better? Could, could we imagine a world in which there exists a superior product and, and compare it to that? Um, but that being said, I do understand that Mike Duncan's purpose is never to get into every last nitty gritty detail. Mike Duncan's purpose is to make a digestible summary. So somebody like me who looks at this and say, oh, he should have added this, he should have added that, uh, you know, because I want to get into all the details, but am, am I wrong? Uh, would adding more details spoil the flow of the narrative? Now, th there are at least a couple hints here that um, the reason it's only eight episodes is not because eight episodes was the ideal number, because that was the deadline he needed to hit before he packed up and moved to Paris. Um, it, it's a little bit difficult to tell with his phrasing, but uh, th th there are some sentences he mentions where we get the impression that this thing is being wrapped up on a deadline. So um, maybe if Mike Duncan didn't have a move in front of him, he, he would have done 10 episodes instead of eight. Uh, you, you get that impression a little bit. Um, and then, I, yeah, you, you, you wonder how much better it could have been with the additional episodes if, in fact, that was the case, if it was the deadline forcing him to constrain himself. Um, I, okay, yeah. Uh, let me get into some more details a little bit here. So th the first episode, 8.1, uh, is not getting into the Paris Commune at all. It's just getting into the history of the Second French Empire. Uh, and um, I, I begrudge this a little bit because we've only got eight episodes on the Paris Commune. Let's actually get into the Paris Commune, part of me wants to think. On the other hand, that is that episode 8.1 is such a fascinating re recount of the Second French Empire. And it ties up the loose ends uh, from the 1848 season so nicely that I I just can't begrudge it. It's just such a fascinating episode. The only thing, I I have to say this, I have to say this because I'm living in Vietnam. I'm, I'm filming this video from Vietnam right right where I'm sitting here. The, uh, the beginning of the French involvement on in Vietnam happened during this period. Uh, and this, it, it happened for this, much the same reasons as all of uh, Napoleon III's other foreign entanglements, or at least that's my understanding of it. He was trying to balance his precarious political situation in which he knew the Republicans hated him and which he knew that the uh, monarchists hated him. And so he was trying to en enhance French prestige around the world and uh, he was trying to create a Catholic base of, base of support. So that's one of the reasons he got into Vietnam is because the Catholic min, uh, missionaries were, were wanting some sort of protection here. And the Catholic missionaries were also uh, concerned that the Vietnamese government was interfering with their missionary efforts. Um, I, I mean, I, I understand why Mike Duncan didn't open that can of worms because um, it's it's not one of the major, from the standpoint of European history, it's not major. Now, from, from the standpoint of world history, obviously the fact that the French got into Vietnam is going to have cascading effects that are going to ripple through the Cold War history of the 20th century. But okay, in, in terms of the actual history of the, the Second Empire itself, it's, it's a sideshow. But, you know, it's, I, I'm living here in Vietnam, so I, I can't re resist mentioning it. Uh, a, a good book, if you're interested in this, is The Roots of French Imperialism in Southeast Asia by John F. Cady, which uh, I'll link to my review of that in the description down below. Uh, that's, um, that was also happening during this period, so just something to be aware of. Okay, tangent over. Uh, then... Uh, Oh yeah, the, the other thing, um, I totally screwed up in my review of the revolutions of 1848 in which I lamented that Mike Duncan did not talk about Blanqui at all, uh, August Blanqui. 
because uh, Blanqui gets plenty of mention in the uh, eight episodes of the Paris Commune, even though Blanqui himself got arrested before the Paris Commune actually got inaugurated. Uh, he was, uh, he and his followers were a major part, the lead up to the Paris Commune. Uh, and uh, Mike Duncan talks so much, so many times about the Blanqui and the Blanquis. Uh, I had, I, I had listened to this way back when, before I had been doing a systematic review of the Paris Com. Uh, sorry, I had listened to season eight way back when, before I had started my systematic review of doing the Revolutions podcast, and I had obviously misremembered it. I, I had misremember, I had misremembered it as uh, Mike Duncan gives such an abbreviated history of the Paris Commune that he leaves out all the major names. And obviously that was wrong. Uh, in fact, he, he, he mentions most of the major names that you could, that need to be mentioned during this period. Yeah, he, he doesn't go into all their stories, um, but he, he at least touches base with all of them. The, the only two names which I think get dropped here uh, or sorry, which which I recognize as being dropped. Um, th there may be others I'm not catching. Uh, is Gustav Florenz and Victor Henry Rochefort? Uh, again, I, I'm probably mispronouncing it. It's it looks like it's Rochefort in English, but Rochefort would be the French pronunciation. Uh, I don't know. So uh, the, 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 these, as I'm going through and thinking, okay, what did Mike Duncan leave out? Th these are the only names that strike me. Uh, now, both of these names I'm, I'm familiar with, among other sources, from Alistair Horne's The Fall of Paris. Uh, and he, he makes a, a big deal about both of these names. Rochefort was uh, somebody who was on the leading edge of uh, radical, ag what's the word I'm looking for? Ag agitizing, uh, agitators, one of the radical agitators leading up to the Paris Commune. But when the actual Paris Commune itself breaks out, he gets cold feet uh, and, and kind of drops out of the public eye during those two months. Uh, not, not that it ends up helping him. He still gets condemned as a communard and, and shipped off to exile. And he, he's got an interesting history after the Paris Commune as well. He comes back and he actually takes a rightward turn near the end of his life and becomes one of the anti-Dreyfusards during the Dreyfus affair in the 1890s. But that, that's, that's going down a whole different... I'm not going to get into that now. Um... And I, I guess Mike, Mike Duncan um, makes a decision to skip over him because he's not going to play a part in the actual Paris Commune itself. But cer certainly uh, after re reading Alistair Horne's book and, and seeing what a big deal he was, at least in the agitation leading up to the Paris Commune, interesting to see him get it skipped out of Mike Duncan's narrative. I, I understand what he, why he does that. The other guy is Gustave Florenz, who... Uh, along with Blanqui, was one of the, the leading revolutionaries. Uh, and he, he, leading up to the Paris Commune. Uh, and he, he, he was an interesting guy. He was a flamboyant revolutionary. He, he, he had the, the, his whole little mini army organized around him. But he gets uh, captured uh, in the, one of the first uh, soirees uh, what, no, is Soray the word I want to use? One of, the, one of the first engagements of the Paris Commune when, when they're meeting up with the Versailles troops. Uh, and then he gets, according to Wikipedia, Wikipedia says he gets murdered by the officer who captured him. I, I seem to remember, I hope I'm not remembering this wrong, that the officer, he goes up to surrender to the officer and the officer just take, recognizes who he is, takes out his saber and just cleaves uh, his, the saber into his skull and kills him on the spot. And then his body gets desecrated by some of the Versailles women, uh, if I remember rightly, just because they thought, you know, oh, you know he's a socialist scum. Um, and 
I guess, you know, because he died fairly early on, uh, maybe that's the reason he gets left out of Mike Duncan's narrative. But both, both of these guys were prominent leading up to it. Other than, the, other than those two, uh, all the other names I can think of, uh, Mike Duncan uh, touches base with. Um, Clusere comes out as the villain in uh, Prosper Oliver Lisa Gray's uh, book on the Paris Commune. Um, and I, sorry. It was interesting to hear Mike Duncan's portrayal of Clusere as, as somebody who actually did have good military sense, but just was the wrong man for the job because he didn't understand revolutionary politics. Uh, compare with that, the scathing assessment that Lisa, um, Lisa Garay gives him. How do you pronounce that? Prosper Oliver, Lisa Garay, the, the, in the Marxist history. Um, I had heard somebody say somewhere, and I forget where I read this, that part of the reason that uh, Clusere comes off so bad in Lisa Garay's history was because he was associate, Lisa, uh, Clusere was an associate of Bakunin. Um, and I wish I could remember where I read that because I've been Googling it and I can't seem to find it. Certainly, uh, the, port the portrait that uh, Mike Duncan gives of Clusere, it, it, he is not an anarchist, uh, far from it. But I guess the, the connection maybe with Bakunin is both he and G Bakunin were in the um, commune in Lyon. So the, 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 the Paris commune was a major one, but there were a few other minor communes that ar arose at the same time which um, Mike Duncan mentions briefly, but doesn't get into any of them, which, which fair enough. Um, but um, Clusere and Bakunin were both associated with the Lyon uh, commune. Something Michael Duncan mentions briefly is that Clusere had seen some of these uprisings before he made his way to Paris. Uh, and that's the, the reason why he thought the rest of France might be sympathetic to the Paris commune. But I, I can't find anything on Google saying whether Clusere and Bakunin ever worked to, with each other in Lyon or whether they were just in the same, um, same, same city at the same time. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm going off on different tangents here. And that, that's what I do in these videos. I go off on tangents that are interesting to me. But before I get lost on too many tangents, let me just return to um, maybe the, the, the central thing that I took away from Mike Duncan's podcast, which was in, in all the other books on the Paris Commune I've read, I, I've always come away a little bit confused with what the ideological uh, divisions were inside the Paris Commune. I mean, I, I knew they were constantly arguing with each other all the time. Oh, sorry, that, sorry. Speaking of constantly arguing with each other all the time, Felix Piat uh, is the other name uh, that Mike Duncan leaves out. Uh, I, it's spelled uh, P-Y-A-T. I'm not sure what the French pronunciation of that would be. Uh, he, he, he uh, comes out as a, a villain in a lot of the histories of the Paris Commune because he uh, seemed to have been more concerned with just pointless arguing than actually doing anything. So a lot of the other communards identified him as someone who was just derailing the discussions. Um, he also goes back to the 1848 revolutions as well. But um, yeah, okay, so... The three names that I identify Michael Duncan is missing out on. Uh, Rockefeller, uh, Gustave Florenz, and Felix Piat. Uh, I'm pronouncing all of those wrong, I'm sure. But yeah, the, the, the thing that comes across really clear in Mike Duncan's uh, narrative of this, which I'd never gotten from any other uh, source, was the, the, the delineation of um, ideologies within the Paris Commune, which Mike Duncan delineates very neatly as the Bakunis, the Anarchists, and the Neo-Jacobins. Um, 
Now, I wonder, I, I, it, it, it's, it's a very neat narrative that Michael Duncan presents and it makes sense and it's fascinating to listen to. I wonder if it's a little bit too neat. Uh, and I'm just wondering because none of the other books I've read on the Paris Commune make this much sense. Uh, so, <clears throat> I, I don't really, I haven't really heard before of an anarchist block within the Paris Commune. Uh, I mean, I, I know individuals like Louise Michel uh, definitely identified as being an anarchist. But within the Paris Commune government itself, I, I just, I, in past books, I sometimes will hear about a majority and a minority within the Paris Commune. And the major, majority is more leaning towards neo-Jacobinism and the minority is, I often hear them, I don't hear them described exactly as anarchists. I hear them as uh, the generation of French radicals influenced by Proudhon, which maybe, that, maybe that's the same thing as being an anarchist, but I, I get the impression that anarchism as a separate political block is maybe 10 years down the road at this point. That, that this is kind of before at this point, we're not willing to say they're anarchists yet. We're just saying they're French radicals influenced by Perdon, who, who make up the minority. Mike, Mike Duncan just goes ahead and calls them anarchists. I, I, I wonder if that's an anachronism. I don't know. I, I'm, i yeah. Uh, I also had the question, I've always had the question about what is the, exactly the difference between a <clears throat> Republican at this point in history in a neo-Jacobin. Mike, Mike Duncan, I think, gives a, a fairly good explanation for that. Um, or as good as explanation as I've gotten so far. Um, he, 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 he <clears throat> and this is kind of coming out of his, the background he's put up in, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, I'm, I'm talking so much I'm, I'm losing my voice. Coming out of the background he's, he's put out in previous episodes, uh, previous series, where he does make a difference between the respectable, respectable Republican opposition and the Neo-Jacobins. So the, the 1789 good uh, versus the 1793 good, uh, different factions in, in French uh, politics. Uh, I, I mean, as far as I can tell, the, the Neo-Jacobins are um, Republicans. They're not socialists, but they're Republicans who idolize the extremis extremism of Marat and Robespierre. Um, that fair to say? I mean, the, the interesting thing, though, about, is about the Neo-Jacobins of the Paris Commune is as Mike Duncan says, they, they abolished the guillotine. So I guess they're just captivated by the nationalism uh, of the, the enthusiasm of 1793 without the terror aspect of it. it it's, it's a little bit, I'm still a little bit confused on it. And, and maybe it's, it's one of those things which is just inherently confusing, which is just a, a little bit inherently nebulous. What is the difference between uh, Republican, you've got the Republicans on one side and the Blanquists on the other side. And the Neo-Jacobins are just kind of in the middle. I don't know. Um, but the, the, the point being, I guess, that the, the way Mike Duncan told it, his three-way division inside the commune between the anarchists, the Blanquists, and the Neo-Jacobins is so completely neat and understandable. I, I wonder a little bit if he's if he's kind of papering over some of the uh, n some of the nebulous parts to, to make it more neat than it actually is. Or I, I wonder, you know, Mike Duncan, it's, it's interesting to remember his bachelor's was not in history. He was a political science degree. So uh, he, he, I think he is maybe at his strength when he is stepping away from the historical narrative to say, wait, okay, before we go any further, 
It's important to know who these guys are. This is this category, this is this category, this is this category. And uh, I, I think he's able to do that so neatly because he's, he's got an, an interest in political science and he's very good at um, making easy to understand definitions of these uh, political ideologies. Okay, uh, yeah, in, in terms of uh, things Mike Duncan leaves out, I, 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 I can think of any number of things that he leaves out. Um, and I'm not gonna go into them now because uh, th th there's no point in me just pedantically listing details that he leaves out. The, the point is that the series could e easily have been longer. There could, easily, there could easily have been a few more personalities that Mike Duncan doesn't talk about that he could talk about. Question is, would it be better if it was longer? Or is it is it just perfect as it is? And you know, I've got to admit, it's very compelling it, listening at the eight minutes that it, uh, that it is in. The, uh, I said I wasn't going to list details that Mike Duncan left out, but one thing, one interesting thing, which I did pick up from Alistair Horne's uh, book, The Fall of Paris, in which I, I can't resist mentioning, is uh, Louis Blanc, the guy who was the uh, socialist leader in 1848, who Mike Duncan does talk about a lot in 1848, the right to work guy. He's still around in 1871, but... Uh, in that confrontation Mike Duncan describes between the, the mayors and the Versailles assembly when they're trying to negotiate a peace, Louis Blanc does not support the Paris Commune. He uh, supports the assembly at Versailles. Uh, and if I'm remembering right, ac according to what was in Alistair Horne's book, Blanc says, we are the ones that are elected. You, you guys are unelected. You're just uh, an uprising. But we, we have the... Uh, the Republican legitimacy here. Again, I hope I'm not misremembering any of that. It's been it's been close to 20 years since I read that book, but I believe uh, Louis Blanc was on the assembly and was not a supporter of the commune. And I think I think if I'm going to nitpick anything, I think that would have been an interesting little detail to include. And Mike Mike Duncan's audience is already familiar with who Louis Blanc was uh, because. Um, it, it, Mike Duncan uh, told his story during the 1848 episodes. Okay, I'm going to start here. I'm going to stop here. Uh, uh, apologies for the fact that I'm a little bit more rambling and a little bit more disorganized than usual on this video. Some, some days are like that. I just... It's, it's the danger of doing these things unscripted, huh? If it's been useful to anyone, great. If it's been tiresome, then... I, I certainly hope you just exercised your right to stop watching long before you got to the end here. And I certainly feel like I've said my piece and that I've gotten all of this outside of my head and outside of myself, uh, which is what the purpose of these videos are anyways, is just to give me an opportunity to relieve my thoughts. And now I can go on with the rest of my day. And on to season nine, the Mexican Revolution, of which I know nothing. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to season nine, the Mexican Revolution. This will be quite an education for me.